As Jujutsu Kaisen Season 2 is now airing, I figured that this would be a better time than ever to explore Suguru Ghetto and what exactly made him and his character arc such an essential piece to the ever growing nuance of the story that is Jujutsu Kaisen. First, we cut back to the Gojo's past arc, where we are introduced to both Satoru Gojo and Suguru Ghetto in Chapter 65. Both Ghetto and Gojo save Utehime, with Gojo asking Utehime, you crying? in order to tease her. And then Geto enters the conversation with his very first line said, Satoru, it's not nice to pick on the weak. After Geto says this, Meimei points out to Geto that, you're the one teasing her without even knowing it Geto. This introduction is a subtle hint at Geto's character, someone who naturally dislikes the weak, yet he cannot truly acknowledge his truth, as he is blinded by his obligation as a Jujutsu sorcerer to protect the weak. As all the sorcerers begin to wrap up the mission, Meimei asks Team Gojo, where's the barrier? And the trio realizes that they screwed up big time. We cut to the news report of the explosion that took place at their mission, with Yaga beginning to lecture the trio, saying that there's someone here who said they put up a curtain and then up and left the auxiliary manager behind, and then forgot about the curtain too. Fess up. As Gojo's team quickly rats Gojo out, he goes ahead and asks, are curtains really necessary in the first place? Does it even matter if normal people see us? With Geto responding, of course it matters. The prevention of cursed spirits is most important for the peace of citizen's mind. For that reason, keeping it confidential is most important. Not only that, and then he is cut off by Gojo. Judging by this interaction between the two, we can see that Geto in this instance is very by the book, and that they may have had this conversation about this topic many times before this as Gojo seems to cut him off as he already knows what Geto's about to say. What this conversation does is establish that Geto is the level-headed and ethically just counterpart to his reckless and selfish counterpart, Satoru Gojo. Shortly after this conversation, Suguro and Satoru are both tasked with escorting the Star Plasma Vessel, Riko Amanai to Tengen in order for Tengen to assimilate her, which will in turn maintain the barriers that protect society from the cursed spirits. Amanai was eventually assassinated by Toju Fushiguro in the Star Vessel Association, and due to this, Gojo and Suguru were emotionally distraught. After Gojo defeats Toji and they carry Rika's corpse out of the chamber, Gojo asks Suguru, should we kill these guys? If we do it now, I probably won't feel a single thing. To which Geto responds saying, nah, there's no meaning in that. Gojo then responds to Suguru saying, meaning, is that really necessary? And then Suguru answers saying, yes, it's very important, especially for shamans. At this moment, Suguru was able to retain his composure and convince Gojo to not massacre the cultists for no reason, despite this moment arguably being one of, if not the most frustrating he's come across until then. Although they defeated Toji Fushiguro, they still suffered such a heavy defeat at the hands of these cultists. No matter how they perceive it, could you truly blame the two had they decided to slaughter each and every one of them right there? Geto maintaining his own composure, let alone managing to convince Gojo to maintain his own, truly says a lot about how extreme he was when he came to following what he believed to be his duty as a Jujutsu sorcerer. As this morally, ethically just sorcerer is one side of Geto, we should also address the other side that Geto followed to an extreme. After Gojo awakens his reverse curse technique and goes on to train himself to a level where he becomes virtually invulnerable, Suguru now defines Gojo alone as the strongest, rather than the two of them together. Due to this, he falls into isolation. The rate of cursed spirits amongst Japan begin to spike, and with the constant ingestion of cursed spirits taking a toll on him, as Geto defines to be the taste like swallowing a whole cloth that was used to wipe a vomit, his mental fortitude deteriorates and he finally says, and for who? Ever since that day I've kept asking myself. What I saw then wasn't that unusual at all. I was well aware of that ugliness. I already knew that and I made the decision to become a shaman despite it. As one who is strong, you must fulfill your obligation. <laughs> Fucking monkeys. At Suguru's breaking point, he confirms to the audience that he's always been aware of his true feelings towards non-sorcerers, yet still decided to protect them despite that. Suguru suffered immensely, time and time again, 
to protect those who mocked him at his highest point of grief. And maybe the only thing keeping him from slaughtering those humans at that time was the presence of Gojo, in the same way that Geto's presence kept Gojo from doing the same. Now that Geto is always in isolation due to him and Gojo being on levels of their own, Geto had nobody to keep him grounded, which accelerates his downward spiral. This moment can also be seen as a metaphor for Suguru struggling to consume his own doubts about the world around him, and how the world expects Geto to just stomach the pain he suffers and move on with it. As this moment was the moment we finally learned what Geto tastes when consuming a cursed spirit, I'm sure that Gege didn't include this for no reason. You can also see these negative feelings of Suguru heavily represented in the first ending of the second season. Whereas Gojo puts up an umbrella to shield himself from the rain, Geto allows it to fall onto him, which is most likely a representation of their coping mechanisms after the hidden inventory arc. And the two fish resembling the actions that both Gojo and Geto take despite their disdain towards their duty. With Gojo going around the loop that is the hidden inventory arc and coming out still duty driven, and on the path of hope, whereas Geto changes completely and becomes permanently damaged due to the trauma such as the fish was, embarking on the journey of despair. As the ending goes on, you see the misery of Suguru littered all throughout it, from how he waves goodbye without showing his face, how we can see that Geto and Shoko smiles on their goodbye shots, and how Geto never smiles even when they all take their picture together as a team. I also think that it's important to point out that the only time we see Suguru smiling in this entire ending is when he is surrounded by all of his fellow first and second years, most notably Yu Haibara. I genuinely believe that this was a reference to how Haibara's death was the pinnacle turning point in Geto's downward spiral into madness, as Haibara was quite literally a shining beacon of joy for all those around him and was the only one to possibly make Geto reconsider his hatred of protecting humanity. This third ending does a very good job at conveying Geto's true feelings and adds a lot to how his inner struggles may have been wearing him out throughout the days. Something also interesting to point out is that both Gojo and Geto had polarizing coping mechanisms to what Toji did to the both of them. Whereas Gojo decided to push himself and train harder than he ever has in order to grow into the ultimate sorcerer to prevent such a failure from ever occurring in the future again, Geto slowly lost the will to continue on this path, due to being focused on the past. These two coping mechanisms are what truly separated the both of them and they also serve as a cautionary tale. For those focused on the future will only move forward and those who are focused on the past will only move backwards. Later on in this arc, we see Geto interact with Yuhai Bara and how Yuhai Bara represents the good of being a sorcerer, reminding Geto of what he still has at that very moment. But since hope was not the path that Geto decided to embark on, we won't get into this conversation much. After Yuhai Bara comes Yuki Sukuma, another special grade sorcerer. She confides in him about her goals, stating that she wants to create a world where no cursed spirits exist. She explains to Geto that cursed spirits are created and formed from the excess cursed energy that leaks from normal humans. And due to this, there are two ways of creating a world where cursed spirits are no longer created. The first way would be to make humanity lose all of their cursed energy, and the second way would be able to make humanity control their cursed energy. Yuki goes on to point out that, if all of humanity were shamans, no curses would be born, which causes him to have an epiphany and remember the faces of those who mocked Rico's death. And then he says, then we should just kill all non-shamans. Yuki glares at Suguru and points out that it's actually a decent plan, which allows Suguru to further open up and say, I used to think that shamans exist to protect them, but lately, it feels like their worth feels shaky to me. The preciousness of the weak and the ugliness of the weak, I've been unable to either separate or accept them. I look down on non-shamans, then try to reject these thoughts. My own vision of this marathon is called shamanism. It's becoming blurry and I can't tell what my true feelings are. With Yuki responding to Geto saying that it's neither, you're not at that stage yet. You who looks down on non-shamans and the you who rejects that idea, these are just possibilities you found. The one you commit to being from now on will define your true feelings. After seeing the man who represents hope pass away before his eyes 
due to a mission he took as a sorcerer to protect the weak. The same weak people who mocked them and seeing how these same weak people treated the twin children sorcerers, he snaps. With Yuki's quote of defining Ghetto's true feelings appearing once more, he then slaughters the non-shamans and becomes an enemy of the world. After Gojo and Ghetto meet for the first time after Ghetto slaughters the village, Gojo tells Ghetto to explain himself, to which Ghetto says that there isn't much more than what Shoko has likely told you. Gojo then asks, you're really going to just kill all non-sorcerers, even your parents? Ghetto then says, I can't go making exceptions for my parents, right? And those people aren't my only family anyway. Gojo then says, that's not what I'm asking. I thought you were against killing if there was no meaning to it. Ghetto then responds saying, ah, but there's a meaning, a significance too. There's even a purpose to it. Gojo then says, no there isn't. You want to make a world of shamans by killing every non-shaman? No fucking way that's going to work. Trying dumb stuff that you know doesn't work is as meaningless as it gets. Ghetto then says, that's pretty arrogant. It's possible for you, right? Satoru, if it's possible for you, can you really go around telling people that it's impossible? Are you the strongest because you're Gojo Satoru? Or are you Gojo Satoru because you are the strongest? If I could become you, then even this foolish idea would be perfectly plausible, don't you think? I've decided how I want to live, so now I'll just do what I can for the sake of it. And kill me if you want. There's a meaning to that. There are a couple of things to be taken out of this meeting with Gojo. First, it displays the progression of the ghetto that was able to remain vigilant to its duty after the crushing defeat suffered at the hands of the non-sorcerers, all the way to the ghetto we see here. As the former was the one who told Gojo to not kill the non-sorcerers because there was no meaning in the first place, whereas the ghetto we see here has decided to kill all non-sorcerers because he has finally found a reason to do so due to Yuki's influence. This reason only seeming to be nonsensical and insane to Satoru due to Suguru's lack of power. He makes it clear to Gojo that it only seems impossible because it's himself making the statement rather than Gojo. Because if Gojo stated he wanted to eradicate all non-sorcerers, would it seem to be such a crazy goal to achieve for him? Who would stop Satoru Gojo in the event he went mad and decided to slaughter all non-sorcerers? The only person with a relative chance in this instance is Yuki Tsukumo, and even that would be an insanely hard fought fight, as we don't know what Gojo's capable of in this moment. After this, Ghetto then asked the million dollar question, are you the strongest because of the person that you are, or are you the person that you are because you are the strongest? First and foremost, Ghetto asking Gojo this was a very low blow. Gojo and Ghetto were so close because Ghetto understood Gojo before he understood all of the unimportant things such as his heritage and strength. To Ghetto, Gojo was not the Satoru Gojo, but just a friend, and someone he understood beyond his abilities. Suguru also being an outlier child to non-sorcerers who became as strong as Gojo also makes him very special. So he was more likely than anybody else that he'd be able to see Gojo as a normal person like the rest. When Ghetto says this, he questions both Gojo's identity and sense of self, something that must have shattered Gojo. Another way to interpret this interaction is to bring up how Gojo used to think of non-sorcerers, saying that they weren't worth protecting, and the Gojo now who questions Ghetto's decision to eradicate all of them. In this instance, Gojo is being a hypocrite, but since Gojo is the strongest there is, who can tell him that he's wrong? So Ghetto asks a question regarding Gojo's strength and identity in order to truly ask him. Do you think you're correct because you have the power to stop me, or do you believe you're correct because you are truly morally correct in this instance? Do you make your decisions off of who you are as a person, or do you make your decisions based off the fact that you can do whatever you want and believe whatever you want? because you're the strongest, which could be another attack on Gojo's identity. Moving past this, something I want to bring up here is that, why did Suguru choose to define his feelings with slaughtering the non-shamans, rather than doing literally anything else? Why did he always choose absolute eradication as the alternative to absolute protection when speaking about non-shamans? How can one struggle so much between these two answers, yet make no effort to create a middle ground? I firmly believe that this is due to a combination of both Ghetto's self-affirmation and Suguru being a man who could not find himself between his duty and emotions. And in a way, his paradoxical choice of eliminating all cursed spirits by eliminating all non-sorcerers represents this. 
As Geto was someone who took both his duty and hatred to the extreme, I believe that they are both a core concept of himself. And if they weren't, he wouldn't have fallen into madness due to his conflict between the two. Despite the extreme difference between the Geto who followed his duty and the one who followed his emotion, there is a strong similarity between the two. And this is the self-affirmation that lies within both. Geto even brings this trait up himself, as he states in Chapter 4 of Jujutsu Kaisen Zero, how selfish, but it's self-affirmation. After all, there's nothing more important in life. No matter which Geto we see in this story, he had always remained someone who prioritized his self-affirmation. To a point where his self-affirmation and his duty led up to him ignoring himself in his most traumatic moments, and to another point where his self-affirmation and his emotions led up to him challenging the entire world, eventually leading to his death. In most moments we have seen Geto, he was driven by this core trait, this trait he deems to be the most important in life. When Geto was traumatized by the non-shamans who mocked Riko's death, he came to realize that protecting these people, their value, is not as important as it first seemed to him. This clash between both his duty and emotion slowly wore him down, up until a point where he was unlucky enough to come across Yuki Tsukumo, who gave Geto a way to save the world without having to protect the non-sorcerers he began to hate so much, and even reinforcing Geto's hate for them. After this, Geto was then able to snuff out the duty-driven side of himself and to affirm to himself that following his emotions could potentially be the correct way to go. Maybe the protection of all non-sorcerers is not the absolute answer like his duty once had him believe. Yuki showing Geto that there could be value in the alternative extreme of the absolute protection of the weak plays a role into why the moment that the next time Geto meets another non-sorcerer, he slaughters them. After this, he becomes no more than delirious off of self-affirmation, slaughtering non-sorcerers at his own whim and even becoming a religious leader, a man who claimed he would save the world by eradicating every non-sorcerer on it, and the same man who once claimed that all sorcerers must protect non-sorcerers no matter what. In the end, I don't believe that Suguru would ever be happy no matter how his life went. He was pulled apart by two extremes that made him absolutely miserable. The self-righteous, duty-driven Suguru and the maniacal, emotionally-driven Suguru were always the same person. And these two extremes pulled him apart and slowly drove him into a downward spiral the very moment he was isolated from his best friends. And finally, Yuki's reinforcement of Geto's belief in the total annihilation of non-sorcerers being the final push. Geto's life wasn't in vain though. As Gojo came to understand Geto's isolation and his suffering, he made a promise to himself. Gojo would create the next generation of sorcerers to all be as strong and capable as he is, so none of them could ever experience what both he and Geto had been through. As he even states himself in chapter 220, I will foster a strong and intelligent group. I won't leave anyone alone. This being a clear reference to Geto, as Gojo had been speaking to Shoko and saying this. Suguru's tragedy gave birth to the strongest and most capable set of sorcerers we have ever seen, and due to this, such a tragedy will never be repeated again. With all this being said, this is obviously going to lead up to another Toji video, as Toji is the man who was once rejected by fate, and in turn completely annihilates it. This ability to destroy fate plays a gigantic role in Geto's development, but that deserves a video itself. I also want to use Geto's story as one to say this. If you find yourself in isolation, try your hardest to get out of it. The negativity that is able to have a grasp on you can be very overwhelming. Reach out to friends, family, or whoever, and just interact with others if you ever find yourself in these type of ruts. If you took the time to watch this, thank you so much. It's genuinely appreciated. Consider liking, subscribing to show me whether or not you guys enjoy content such as this, Thanks and have an amazing day. Peace. So, um, if you got to the end of the video, right, you're here now. Me, I haven't put my face on the camera I'm on this channel in like two months. So a lot of y'all don't even know I had my face on the channel for a little bit. But I just want to say thank you so much for supporting the channel. You know, I, I've grown so much in the past two months and it's all thanks to you guys. You guys are always showing support always engaging with the content and to me that means the world you know what i'm saying uh i don't know how i want to close this out i, I think i just want to say thanks but yeah that, that's it have a great day guys and i'll see you in the next one peace